Mary held a thick, glossy piece of cardboard with beautiful ornate script printed on it. It was an invitation to an anniversary party of Marjorie Blake, the wife of a large, prosperous firm's owner, mother and grandmother to a large family, and a person with a wide circle of acquaintances and interests. Marjorie was Mary's mother-in-law. Stories about the relationship between mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law are as numerous as tales about the complex feelings between mothers-in-law and sons-in-law, all rife with stereotypes and prejudices. But Mary had always been distrustful and sceptical of such stories. Perhaps she was simply lucky. Her mother-in-law was extraordinary in every sense. Marjorie was truly blessed by nature, beautiful without any reservations. She resembled the movie divas of the fifties and sixties, with their femininity multiplied infinitely. She had deep velvety eyes, full, well-defined lips, and lush, lustrous blonde hair. Women harboured an unhealthy envy for Marjorie Blake, while men maintained a healthy and well-founded interest. Both feelings remained strong and nearly unchanged, despite the passing years. Marjorie's decision to celebrate her jubilee, as the official invitation irrefutably proved, was, on one hand, expected. After all, turning 55 is a milestone for anyone, and the peculiar magic of having lived more than half a century affects even the most hardened opponent of celebrating life events. On the other hand, Mary knew well how Marjorie had desperately resisted her loving husband to organise a celebration. Is it really necessary to remind everyone once again how old I am? And to do it with loud music, fireworks, and a crowd of people? She had muttered. In speaking of old age, the woman was certainly being a bit coy. She looked not just good for her age, but splendid. Come on, darling, her husband had pleaded. Let's have at least a small party. For a hundred people? No more? Seeing the horror in his wife's eyes, he shrugged and hurriedly added, Well, think about it. Look, children, grandchildren, your sister and her husband. My favourite little brother with his new girlfriend. I know you don't like her much, but what can you do? That's eighteen people already. And what about your friends? I have many colleagues and partners eager to congratulate you. Let's be honest, they're not rushing to congratulate me, but to curry favour with you. They don't care about me particularly. It's just unnecessary expense for all. Speaking of which, I'll agree to this horror, which for some reason will be considered my celebration, on one condition. No laying of gifts and huge bouquets at my feet. Do you hear me? You can tell your co-workers and partners, and our friends already know. Anyone bringing a bouquet of more than 15 flowers or a gift worth more than $50 gets kicked out. Warn everyone. Thomas Blake sighed. They were a beautiful, harmonious couple. Having celebrated their 30th wedding anniversary, they had somehow preserved not only the respect and gratitude, but also a genuine tenderness that made their eyes sparkle when they looked at each other. Mr. Blake was convinced, and never hid the fact, that without his wife's support and help, he would never have achieved a tenth of what he had today. And there was much to be proud of. Blake owned and ran a large transportation company that delivered goods worldwide. He had started many years ago with two cheap rattling trucks that threatened to fall apart, if not during one order, then surely during the next. He earned money, took out loans, signed contracts, bought new trucks, and generally got back on his feet. Meanwhile, Marjorie, an economist by training, gave birth to and raised their children, managed the household, worked and handled the bookkeeping for her husband's company at night. She stood by him through thick and thin. In the mid-90s, the first serious money and opportunities emerged, 
Unfortunately, big money often brings big problems. When Thomas was accused of concealing income and evading taxes, Marjorie learned firsthand the difference between police stations, prosecutors' offices, and law firms tirelessly seeking justice. In their case, truth prevailed, thanks largely to Marjorie's persistence and determination. Along with the financial evidence she presented to the court, Thomas was released with all charges dropped. But those harrowing weeks left an indelible mark on both of them. Marjorie got me out," Thomas declared emphatically. "Without her, I'd have undoubtedly gone to prison for a long time. I might have lost my mind even sooner. I was weak then; my stomach still giving me trouble. Marjorie brought me steamed cutlets by bus every day. One day, I was sitting there feeling sorry for myself. I'd lost all hope, given up on everything." Then I opened the food container, and there on the rice she'd spelled out, "Hang in there with peas." I thought, "What kind of weakling are you? She's out there fighting tooth and nail with three kids in tow, trying to save you, and you, a big strong man, are wallowing in self-pity." It lifted my spirit so much that the guard spent half a day searching for whatever had supposedly cheered me up. When the business took off, Marjorie immersed herself in the company's finances. Despite significant turnover, money was still tight. The family of five continued living in a modest three-bedroom apartment, driving used cars with dented bumpers, and dressing in ordinary clothes. Nothing classy, the doled-up wives of other businessmen would say about Marjorie, barely concealing their irritation. Have you seen what she wears? Although with her figure, she could wear anything. They could hardly bring themselves to admit that Marjorie dressed not in exorbitantly priced designer clothes, but in a well-worn yet elegant suit that perfectly fit her figure, unaffected by all her pregnancies, still looked stunning. However, it was Marjorie who transformed her husband from a man who had worn old jeans and scuffed sneakers for years into a true dandy. Thomas, you're the head of the company, not some trucker," she'd admonish. "Stand up straight. No, no, that tie doesn't go well with that. Let's try this shirt with the grey suit. There, that's better. Now you look more decent and more suitable for the owner of the company. Through her years of effort, Thomas Blake, naturally imposing, broad-shouldered with refined features, became a man who caught the eye of women of all ages. Social statuses and professions. Great, I've created problems for myself. Marjorie would laugh. Now, how do I keep such a handsome man out of trouble? However, for Thomas, other women simply didn't exist. There was only one: his Marjorie, the centre of his universe, the love of his life. The family was Thomas Blake's greatest source of pride. Perhaps even more so than the company he'd built from scratch. Here too, he always acknowledged his wife's crucial role. These are Marjorie's children. I'm just the assistant. These somewhat self-deprecating words held some truth. Marjorie raised their children, daughters Holly and Anna, sons Steve and Walter, largely on her own, despite her often unimaginable workload. Sometimes rivaling her husband's, even when the family could afford a nanny, there were no outsiders in the house. The children, to everyone's envy, grew up to be nearly perfect. You two should write a book called "How to Raise a Normal Kid If You Have Money." One of Marjorie's acquaintances, struggling with a teenage son, remarked bitterly, "It's practically a science these days." The Blake children excelled in their studies. And befitting the offspring of a respectable family, engaged in dancing, foreign languages, and tennis, Steve took up rock climbing, while Holly played the violin beautifully. All four deeply respected and loved their parents, seemingly appreciating everything invested in them. Holly graduated high school and went to study in France, disappointing those who expected the Blakes' parenting approach to fail. 
She completed university, started working, and didn't lose control or go off the rails. Though Holly didn't return to her homeland, she married a Frenchman and lived happily with her husband and two children, sending her family photos of perpetually sunny and green Provence. Anna, younger than her sister by less than two years, adamantly refused to study abroad. She was a quiet homebody, affectionately called clumsy by the family. She attended college diligently and married without drama to a childhood friend, the son of one of her father's long-time clients. She had three growing children, including twin boys, who would likely wreak havoc on their grandfather's mansion, and the baby, born recently. Steve, the third child in the family, was the parents' main hope for continuing the family business. He had graduated from a prestigious university with a law degree. At his father's insistence, he spent a couple of years in law enforcement before becoming a legal advisor in their transport company. To everyone's surprise, instead of quickly climbing the career ladder, he had spent three years in the ordinary position of staff lawyer, handling contract work. Thomas seemed to be scrutinizing his son, weighing something crucial for himself, his family, and the entire company. Marjorie, accustomed to trusting her husband's judgment of people and their value to the company, merely raised her eyebrows in surprise. He's not cut out for it, dear, Thomas confided to his wife. Not at all. Sure, he can draft a contract, check legal documents, that sort of thing. But Steve lacks that spark, that hunger for business. Steve appeared content with this arrangement. He diligently went to work, shuffled papers, and occasionally travelled on business trips. Apparently, he wasn't bothered that even his wife Mary commanded more respect in the business world than he did. They had a daughter, Erica, whom her grandfather adored as the only granddaughter among his grandchildren. Walter, the Blake's second son, was the youngest and final child in the family, their happy accident, as his parents jokingly called him. After declaring she wouldn't have more children, Marjorie realised a few days later that she had been overly categorical. So, what should we do? she asked her husband. What do we do? Have the baby, of course, Thomas replied, puzzled by the need for discussion. We're both in our forties. People will say we've lost our mind in your old age. Marjorie laughed. I don't care. I want another child, boy or girl, or twins. The prospective father was elated. The baby was born healthy and lively, like all their other children. Moreover, he grew to be the most handsome and talented of the four. Walter seemed destined to be the crowning glory of the Blake family. He was a quick learner with brilliant results, swam beautifully and effortlessly conversed in two languages, sometimes simultaneously. He was tall and stately like his father, but his mother's subtle, understated beauty was evident in him. Of the four children, he likely inherited the most from both parents. After eighth grade, Walter was sent to college in England. Everyone silently assumed he would be the successor, though no one dared say it aloud. Walter's birth brought an unexpected problem to the otherwise harmonious family. Steve disliked the baby. While the teenage girls squealed with delight over the new arrival, Steve struggled to accept his younger brother. "'Why do you need him? To replace me?' Steve whispered to his mother, fighting back angry tears. "'Oh, Steve, my darling, what are you saying?' Marjorie hugged her son, alarmed. "'How could Walter replace you? You're a grown boy now, but you're talking nonsense.' "'We've been spoiled, you and me,' she mused that evening, serving Thomas's dinner. "'We're used to everything going smoothly. Now I'm at a loss.' "'Don't worry.' Thomas declared authoritatively, Steve will get over it. He'll adjust. Whether Steve ever truly accepted, 
no longer being the youngest, and therefore automatically the most cherished, child remains unclear. But he voiced no further complaints, and the family simply grew accustomed to Steve's lack of affection for his brother. Marjorie treated her sons-in-law and daughters-in-law with genial simplicity. They're my children's problems, not mine, she'd say. To me, they're all fine. When Mary first met her future mother-in-law, she was stunned. My gosh, I had no idea such women existed, she thought on her way home. Then, after getting to know her better, she stopped being afraid of the fantastic nature of this woman. Her mother-in-law was impeccably polite and pointedly correct. She never offered unsolicited advice, didn't try to be over-friendly, and maintained a respectful distance. It would never have occurred to Mary to attempt to befriend the queenly lady. Marjorie had been the company's long-standing and irreplaceable financial director, and a few years ago she announced to her startled husband, "'That's it. I'm taking a vacation. I've calculated you owe me 672 days of regular leave and 336 days of additional leave for the past 24 years. I'll take my holiday, and we'll see what happens after.' Now, she lived in a spacious country mansion surrounded by verdant lawns, tended to her roses, and, in her own words, led the comfortable life of a very wealthy retiree. She was preparing to celebrate her 55th birthday with a gathering of close friends and acquaintances. It was still two weeks before the celebration, but Mary was already spinning around the mirror with discontent. Well, I could still lose a little weight, her thoughts fluttered like frightened sparrows. Oh, damn, I meant to start that rice diet last month, and I need to do some exercises, squats or something. She opened the tall, mirrored closet, where a few weekend dresses hung in the corner. Mary pulled the items out, spread them on the bed, and stared at them doubtfully. Among the things lying before her, Nothing suitable for the upcoming event caught her eye. No dress, no shoes, and no idea what to do with her hair. And anyway, this is a disaster. She sat on the edge of the bed and gazed fearfully at her reflection. I've got to call Chloe. A life-saving thought flashed through her mind and she immediately felt relief. Chloe had been Mary's best, and in fact only, friend since childhood. They had been close all their lives, spending more time together than some sisters. Their families lived on the same stair landing, and the girls had been visiting each other's apartments since kindergarten. They didn't attend school together, though, as Mary was a year older. Despite this, Chloe, always active and a bit of a bully, was the leader of their little duo. This friendship lasted through the end of school, after which the girls went their separate ways. Mary studied law, while Chloe, deciding she wouldn't earn a living shuffling papers, opted for hairdressing and stylist courses. Was it for nothing that I sheared and combed my poodle for ten years? I guess I got used to it, and don't think it's any harder with people, she explained her unexpected career choice laughing. Jokes aside, Chloe hadn't erred in choosing her life's work. It truly became something she did with understanding, pleasure and interest, and consequently, with excellent results. Possessing a natural flair and imagination, she unerringly decided what each client needed. Chloe only secondarily considered what the client wanted. With decisive snips of her scissors, she transformed not just the appearance of her visitors in the blink of an eye, but sometimes their whole lives. Getting an appointment with Chloe for a haircut and colouring became the cherished dream of dozens, if not hundreds of women. Her phone number was passed on like a precious jewel. Well, that's right, Chloe said without false modesty, when Mary, laughing, told her she'd been offered money for her phone number. I'm not just styling hair, I'm selling people happiness. No, 
Really? Imagine this woman came to me yesterday, face like a horse's, long, huge forehead, hair lying like soot on her shoulders. She sits down and says, I need to trim my ends. Can you believe it? So I trimmed it. I cut half her hair into a quiff and the rest to her shoulders. She started bawling, scared me half to death. You were frightened? Mary asked incredulously. Can you imagine? I thought, oh no, here comes a huge scandal. But the thing is, I was right. With bangs and a normal length, she instantly became beautiful. I asked her, why are you crying? And she said, because of happiness. Mary knew from her own experience that a successful visit to the hairdresser could indeed make one much happier. She herself naturally possessed what Chloe called the ideal appearance of a scout. You know, it's impossible to remember you. Chloe would say, no offence, OK? It's like you're invisible. So, it's the same whether I exist or not, right? Mary twisted her friend's words ironically. It's not like that, Chloe protested. You exist, but you don't stand out at all. And honestly, you're my personal shame. I'm itching to fix you up. Mary, three hours of work and you won't recognize yourself. That's just it, Mary laughed. I'd very much like to recognize myself. Oh, come off it, you bore. Chloe waved her hand and gave Mary the usual treatment. Hair dye and a light melt. I wish you'd learned something good from your mother-in-law. I saw your Marjorie once. Now that's what I call a phoenix. And now, when Mary explained to Chloe that the phoenix had an anniversary coming up and she wanted to look more presentable, Chloe nearly broke the phone in her excitement. Thank goodness you at least thought to call me, she shouted into the receiver. I don't even need to come over. I already know you have nothing suitable for such an occasion. What about my gold strapless dress? Mary asked pitifully. It's not gold. It's brown. And you look like a décolleté potato in it, Chloe said sternly. Good Lord, you're going to a gala for one of the most stylish women in town. Can't you listen to people who understand these things for once? A few days later, Mary was almost ready and once again convinced that Chloe knew her business. Don't you dare gain or lose weight, she ordered. I'll come the day before to touch up your colour. The organisation of the anniversary party exceeded all expectations. A huge, striped tent stretched over the emerald lawn, under which guests strolled between light tables laden with snacks. Ubiquitous, well-trained waiters with trays of drinks appeared at the mere thought of refreshment. The soft background music complemented rather than interfered with conversation. Steve, Mary and Erica arrived before most of the guests. As family members, they were expected to help welcome the newcomers. Three-year-old Erica quickly abandoned her mother's instructions and with her grandfather's full support rushed to meet her cousins. Anna's children, who had flown in from the capital. Steve vanished imperceptibly, leaving Mary face to face with her mother-in-law. Hello, Mary, her mother-in-law greeted her with a regal nod. Come sit with me. Let's watch our guests ruin the lawn with their stilettos. I warned Thomas it wasn't a good idea for both the girls and the grass. Now he'll have to deal with the consequences. Mary sat next to Marjorie sipping her favourite cocktail while scanning the crowd for familiar faces. The unusually large gathering, mostly of strangers, made it difficult for her to spot those she knew. As always, she immediately noticed her father-in-law. She also saw Anna, surrounded by her rambunctious offspring, whom she was trying to calm down. The boys were being egged on by Mary's daughter. As Mary anxiously watched Erica attempt to drag one of the cousins between the legs of a chair, she heard Marjorie say sternly, 
It was a bad idea to bring the children here, wasn't it? Mary suddenly felt like a delinquent schoolgirl, but just then she heard her mother-in-law's infectious laughter. I'm only joking, Marjorie said, still laughing. I wish we could disperse all this prim people exhibition, keep only the little ones, and have a real party. Now that would be an anniversary. By the way, Walter's semester is in full swing, so he won't be here. She truly is an amazing woman, Mary marvelled once again. How did I end up in this family? Mary was born into a family worlds apart from her present surroundings. She grew up in a simple five-story panel building, where neighbours along the entire riser would wish a sneezing person good health. Mary's father, a lifelong factory engineer, was an incredibly calm and kind man. He approached everything in life correctly and thoughtfully, except for one thing, his marriage. Andrea was a sweet yet capricious creature, more than ten years younger than John, Mary's father. This seemingly small age difference proved to be an unbridgeable gap. The young woman wasn't just younger, she was also far less mature, yet demanded tenfold care and attention. Having given birth to a daughter, she quickly realised that motherhood wasn't in her immediate plans. As a result, John became the de facto mother to Mary. Andrea's departure from their lives went almost unnoticed. Mary was too young to pay attention or wonder about it. John, of course, noticed his wife's disappearance, but, frankly speaking, had no time to dwell on it. He learned to make milk porridge and make formula. He was terrified when Mary fell ill, seemingly falling ill himself a hundred times over in sympathy. He helped with her homework. While mathematics and physics posed no problem for the engineer, the intricacies of the language left him baffled. He attended parent-teacher meetings, blushing painfully under the curious stares of young mothers and the sympathetic gaze of the elderly class teacher. He learned to separate coloured laundry from white, braid pigtails, and even darn pantyhose, which Mary wore through much faster than he could buy. As Mary grew older, she became aware of the difference between her family and those around her. While single-parent families with single mothers were common, she was the only one with a single father, a label she found terribly offensive, and Mary couldn't let it go. So one evening she sat down opposite her father and placed a chessboard on the table between them. He looked at his daughter in surprise. "'I want you to teach me how to play,' the eight-old girl said firmly. So they played chess and checkers, bingo and football. They skied and skated, read books, listened to hissing vinyl records, on a dying record player, cooked soups, and then merrily scrubbed the kitchen clean. John was never a single father, and Mary was never an abandoned child. They had each other, and they were happy. After high school, Mary entered the law faculty at the university. She excelled in her studies. After graduation, a man in an impeccable suit approached her, politely offering his business card. Interesting work, I mean your diploma, and the topic you've chosen, transportation safety, is relevant to us. If you're looking for a job, we'd be glad to have you come in for an interview. We don't have any vacancies at the moment, but we'd be happy to include you in our talent pool. Mary turned the business card in her hands and sighed happily. Well, it's not exactly a job offer, but at least there's interest in my modest, unimportant self. If only I knew who's inviting me. She hurried to her department to consult the professor supervising her thesis project. He was an experienced man who seemed to know every company in the city. Mr. Bichel, I need your advice. I've been invited for an interview at this company, she said, handing him the business card. Should I go? What do you think? Oh, you're in luck. Congratulations, he exclaimed. It's a great company. The owner's an interesting character, a self-made man, you know, 
the type who does everything himself. You should definitely go, Mary. Absolutely. Mary's first visit to the company office left her stunned. It was like something out of a movie. The enormous, light-coloured building with glass walls seemed only nominally divided into offices and zones. In reality, everyone worked in one spacious room. She later realised that departments, services, and management levels were organised by floor, with higher floors indicating higher ranks. The legal department, where she might work by a stroke of luck, was nearly at the top. On the seventh floor of the eight-story building, who's on the eighth floor? She asked, counting the buttons in the elevator. Management, the clerk escorting her replied with awe. Department heads, deputies, and Blake himself. The reverence with which he pronounced himself made Mary laugh. The young man looked at her sternly, confused by her reaction. He waved towards an open door and muttered, "Wait there. Someone from HR will be with you shortly." Then he scurried down the corridor, his entire demeanor expressing a firm determination to work diligently, so that one day he might have the great honor of briefly setting foot on the hallowed eighth floor. Mary entered the empty office and sat at the large conference table. Clearly, she was meant to wait. Someone walked past, then backtracked and peered into the room. "Hello, are you expecting someone?" A pleasant, deep male voice snapped her out of her reverie. A tall, broad-shouldered man stood in the doorway. His grey hair, deep wrinkles, and hands betrayed his age, clearly over fifty. But his posture and the energy radiating from him seemed to contradict this. His suit, though slightly old-fashioned, fit his statuesque figure perfectly. Now that's a man, Mary thought, involuntarily admiring him. Mademoiselle, forgive me, but I asked you a question, she heard him say. The man stood by the table, hands behind his back, regarding her sternly. I'm sorry, I was lost in thought, Mary replied. About what, may I ask? Your suit," she blurted out. "My what?" His face registered genuine surprise. "Well, your suit," she mumbled, feeling embarrassed. But then she lifted her head stubbornly and smiled. "It fits you perfectly. That's rare to see." The man looked at her with interest, stepped into the office, and sat down across from her. "You're here for an interview, I presume." May I ask your name, and what position are you applying for? I'm Mary. I'm not applying for anything specific yet. I'd be happy with a position as a solicitor, though I've been told there are no vacancies, and I might be added to the candidate pool. Ah, a lawyer then? That's good. Well, let's see what else you're good at, besides appreciating suits. I'd like your professional opinion on this document. He placed several stapled pages in front of her. Mary took a deep breath and picked up the document. It was a standard contract for road freight transportation, containing typical errors made more from carelessness or haste than ignorance of basics. And Mary was quick to emphasize all the flaws she saw in the document. Well, the man said after a long pause, "If you want to work for us." You can start tomorrow, but I thought you had no vacancies," Mary exclaimed. "You know, I have a feeling one will open up," he said, quickly jotting something on a small piece of paper. "Take this and go straight down the hall to the HR office. Ask for the supervisor and give him this." He handed Mary what looked like a note, consisting of a few words and ending with an elaborate signature. Leaving the office. Mary heard a voice behind her. Jessica, please bring Hanlon's personal file from the legal department. No, I'm not in my office. I'm in the conference room. The interview? It's already over. Don't worry. Yes, I did it myself. For some reason, Mary felt sorry for the unknown Hanlon. There was something in the man's voice that didn't bode well for him. 
Well, it looks like I've set someone up, she thought. Then again, the mistakes in the contract were quite childish, especially for such a solid firm. And I'm not so great myself. What kind of lawyer doesn't even ask who they're talking to? This man could have been some local eccentric in a fancy suit. It will be funny if they tell me to shove that note somewhere else. A few minutes later, Mary realized she had unwittingly spoken to someone very important. The head of the personnel service, a tall, black haired woman, glanced at the note and shifted her frightened gaze to Mary. Are you from Mr. Blake? Please come in. I don't know any Mr. Blake. Oh, that must be the man who spoke to me. He didn't introduce himself, and for some reason I didn't ask. Really? You were talking to Mr. Blake himself, and you didn't even know it. Thomas Blake is the owner and CEO of our company. That's how Mary found herself at the company as a legal counsellor for contractual work. The job was interesting and promising, the salary was decent, and her colleagues were agreeable. She quickly fell into the daily routine of a large office, and life settled into a quiet, typical pattern. The surprises began when Mr. Blake burst into their large office like a whirlwind. After speaking with some specialists, he suddenly stopped at Mary's desk. So, how are you settling in? He leaned closer, winked discreetly, and whispered, How do I look today? Am I presentable? Is the suit up to par? Mary looked up in amazement, smiled, and gave a discreet thumbs up. How do you know the boss personally? Vicky, the girl at the neighboring desk, couldn't contain her curiosity. He hired me, Mary shrugged. It just happened by chance. What a chance, Vicky whispered excitedly. You know, you have to take advantage of such opportunities. It could be a once in a lifetime thing. What do you mean? Mary stared at her, puzzled. Are you serious or what? Vicky's eyes widened. By the way, the boss's son Steve works here too. Gossip around the family and wealth of the firm's owners didn't interest her, but she was quite taken aback by the fact that the owner's son worked as an ordinary lawyer. Yeah, can you believe it? Showing off, playing at democracy. Look how principled we are, keeping our son on a tight leash. The girl was clearly getting carried away, and Mary hurried to end the conversation. So, Steve Blake, whom I had contacted several times for work, isn't just a namesake or a poor relative of the director, as she had thought, but his own son. Mary thought, what a family. Well, it's none of my business. She interacted regularly with Steve. They worked in neighbouring offices, engaged in the same line of work, and often exchanged information, data and documents. He was even-tempered, polite, and seemed very lonely. It appeared that he was constantly immersed in gloomy reflections, sluggishly and mechanically doing his work without interest. How can this be? Mary wondered to herself. He's the heir. He should be passionate about this business, concerned about it, interested in every detail. After all, he's the future owner of the company, and yet he acts as if he's here on assignment from the job centre. Most importantly, he did only the assigned work, as if he were just another hire and a stranger to the company. He never showed any initiative, didn't seek to make decisions or take responsibility, and generally behaved like someone who didn't care what would happen to the company tomorrow. Six months after Mary started working at the company, Steve didn't show up for work. They say he broke his leg, the local know-it-all gossip girl, who was always on top of all official and especially unofficial office news, immediately reported. It's a compound fracture, and he'll be in bed for at least a month. Oh, who'd let me lie around in a cosy apartment? I'd take all three months. A couple of days later, Steve Blake called Mary. 
Mary, hello, he said. You've probably heard about my mishap. I'm lying here and feeling like I'm getting dumber from idleness. I decided to do some work, but then I realized I had no papers. I'm sorry, but could you bring me something? Me? Mary marveled. Please don't take offense. I'm not so brazen as to use you as a courier, but I wouldn't want my papers to be touched by an outsider, even if they're trusted. You understand? It's confidential information, after all. And I can be trusted. What if I'm just waiting for an opportunity to poke my nose into your papers? She said jokingly. I trust you, he said firmly. Can't I send you the documents you need by email, for example? She didn't feel comfortable wasting valuable time and travelling to an unknown place for the sake of a few papers, even if they were necessary for the director's son. Yes, of course, but you see, my diary is there with the necessary entries. I need it most of all. You can't send it like that. He grew sad. Well, I'm sorry. To hell with the paperwork. I'll make do. Mary suddenly felt ashamed. A man lying there with a fracture. He called, asked for help, and she's being coy. Some indispensable businesswoman she thought she was. Besides, Steve surely didn't mean for her to use public transportation. Okay, I'll bring everything. But how will I get to you? I have no idea where I'm going or how I'm going to get there. Oh, don't worry about that. I'll send a car for you right away. He sounded so relieved that she felt ashamed again for almost turning him down. An hour later, the car pulled up to the Blake mansion. It was a sight to behold. Not a huge, gaudy house that overwhelmed the imagination, but behind the cast-iron fence stood a large, elegant, white brick building. Its huge windows seemed to float above the emerald lawns surrounding the house. Mary sighed admiringly. Gorgeous roses and sprawling hydrangea bushes, like huge balloons, adorned the grounds. Everything around the house exuded wealth, but it wasn't gaudy, showy, or pompous. The Blake's family taste was impeccable. She was escorted deep into the house to the second floor. In a large room, Steve lay on a special bed with a traction device. His plastered leg was elevated on hangers. He was pale, his face overgrown with stubble, wearing his usual calm expression of boredom and indifference. At the sight of Mary entering, however, he perked up a little and even flashed a smile. Here's everything you asked for. She handed Steve a weighty package. He immediately opened it, took out a small diary in a beige leather cover, and curiously shoved it under his pillow. Mary thought she heard him exhale a sigh of relief. Thank you, Steve said. You have no idea how much you've helped me, Mary. Oh, it's nothing, she replied. I just brought some papers. But I've had a chance to admire your marvellous roses. Ah, those are mothers, Steve grinned. She's a bit obsessed with those roses. Messes with them all day long, always getting scratches on her hands. Messes with roses? By herself? Your mum? Mary couldn't believe that the wife of such a rich man was tending to the flowers herself. She had imagined such ladies spent their days in spas, with a personal manicurist for each nail. I have unusual parents from all perspectives, especially my mum. Steve smirked again for some reason. Mary found the expression on his face somewhat inappropriate for a conversation about his beloved parents. Well, Steve, get well. I should go. I might still have time to do something useful at work, too. She rose from the chair where she'd been sitting. Mary, please stay a while longer, if you have time, he suddenly said. At that moment... Steve appeared so abandoned, lonely, and unhappy that she almost burst into tears. Get a grip, you fool, Mary reprimanded herself. Here's the son of a millionaire, practically the owner of a huge firm. You're standing in the middle of a mansion 
you have only seen on TV, and you're going to pity him. No, Mary, you definitely have a problem with your head. Everyone's gone, and I'm lying here all alone. He smiled gently. Well, surely there are people to visit you, Mary asked jokingly, trying to keep the conversation going. No one, Steve sighed. You know it's the plight of all sons of rich parents who studied abroad. All my friends are far away, and here, well, people like to befriend heirs, and I'm just a prince in a supporting role. He grinned crookedly. Mary understood little of this strange rambling. Come on, Steve, you work, and overall you're a good man. Steve started talking, became cheerful, and they suddenly found common topics for conversation. In general, when not immersed in his own thoughts, Steve Blake turned out to be a sociable, witty, and interesting conversationalist. He read extensively, was erudite, and most importantly, had travelled the world and lived in several countries. Mary, whose knowledge of the world was still limited to her hometown. Except for a few childhood trips to the sea with her father, perceived his stories as tales from another galaxy. Steve, seeing that she listened to him with unprecedented interest and even some delight, warmed to his subject and enthusiastically shared anecdotes from his foreign student life, cleverly weaving in the names of places of interest. They didn't notice that it was beginning to get dark outside. The large window overlooking the garden. Oh, how am I going to get home? Mary said. Don't worry, they'll take you. Steve promised and called the driver. Well, thank you. I was interested to talk to you, she said sincerely. What? You? Thank you. Maybe now I won't be so sad. At least until tomorrow. Listen, he exclaimed. As if an idea had suddenly occurred to him, why don't you come again? Well, just like that, without any paperwork, out of simple human compassion. I don't think that's a good idea, Steve. Mary looked at him uncertainly. It's uncomfortable, and I wouldn't want the company to. No one will find out anything in the company. I swear to you. He returned to his usual frown. I don't want any gossip myself. In fact, I haven't cared what anyone thinks of me for a long time. You, on the other hand, I'd like to shield from it all. Well, I'll try to visit you again, some time. I promise. She extended her hand to Steve and felt a strong, firm shake. I'll be waiting. She heard as she turned to leave. She had very mixed impressions on this visit. On one hand, Steve turned out to be not at all the boring bore she had imagined from her acquaintance at work. It seemed to her that he was interested in her. In any case, for her sake, he had dropped his identity as a bored heir to the empire and become a normal man. On the other hand, there was such a huge gap between them that she didn't even want to think about any relationship other than a purely business one. And in general, it all seemed to be the whim of a bored rich boy. Mary put it all out of her head and plunged into work, and thinking about a very difficult and important issue: what to give her father for his birthday. A few days later, Steve called her again. "Hello, Mary," he addressed her officially. "I would like to remind you of the commitment you have made." What commitments, Steve? What are you talking about? She asked in a whisper. Well, a promise to visit me. I promised nothing. I said I would try. She was surprised and frankly thrown off by this unexpected call. Well, try then, please, he pleaded. I'm really begging you. Otherwise, I'll just die of boredom. Okay. She glanced resignedly at the calendar hanging on the wall. Tomorrow was Saturday, and she had very different plans. But after all, there was basic compassion for the man. If I get there tomorrow by three o'clock, will you be home? 
She uttered the phrase, and only a few minutes later realized what a silly thing she had said, given to his broken leg. There was laughter in the receiver. It was the first time she'd heard Steve laugh. You know, I probably will. So come, I'll be waiting, he said, his laughter subsiding. The next day, Mary arrived at the Blake's house. Having already habitually sighed with admiration over the rose bushes at the entrance, she went to the second floor. Steve was still lying in the same pose, but he seemed to be a different person. He was wearing a white shirt, he was clean shaven, and his hair, which had hung down in not very clean icicles on his face the last time they had met, was shiny and had clearly been styled with a comb and a special product. Steve smiled and held out his hand to Mary. So, that's why Steve dressed up for today. I was wondering what the parade was all about. He finally shaved, dressed up, tidied the room. A woman entered the room, very beautiful, with skillfully applied eyeliner, enhancing her eyes, carrying her beautiful head as if it were her most prized possession. The Countess Mother has come to see her crippled Count Son, Steve pronounced with a chuckle. No need to bestow noble titles on a son, we have none. We are simple people, not without faults, and our main fault is that we are rich. But we are fighting it, said the woman, looking at Mary with marvellous velvet eyes. Here she is, the famous Madame Blake, about whom the office still tells legends, thought Mary. Yes, the office gossips were not exaggerating at all, when they spoke of her beauty and power over people. Meanwhile, the woman snorted and said, "'You've become remarkably rude since the accident, Steve. Are you going to introduce us, or shall we do it without you?' "'Mum, this is Mary, a lawyer for our company. Father himself recently hired her.' If she knew how to do it, Mary would probably have curtsied. "'Wait, wait!' Marjorie seemed to recall something definitively. Weren't you the one who complimented my husband on his suit? He was telling me how at your interview you discussed his appearance. Well, you know, Mr. Blake exaggerates a bit. I just couldn't help but admire the way his jacket fits him. It's really very nice, isn't it? And you know, girl, that's a compliment to me, not my old catcher. If you knew, Mary, how long and painful it took me to get him out of his tracksuits and jeans. She rolled her eyes and shook her head playfully. Thank you. All in all, the day went wonderfully. They drank tea on the veranda, and the conversation, skillfully conducted by Marjorie, didn't tire Mary at all. She realised with amazement that Steve's mother now knew almost everything about her. That's someone who should work for the security service, thought Mary. Then they played a game of chess with Steve. Mary beat him in ten moves, and, leaving the sick man unusually thoughtful, departed for home. Come visit us, we'll be very glad, said Marjorie, at parting, and for some reason Mary didn't have the slightest doubt about the sincerity of these words. Steve recovered and limping a little, went to work. Some time later, the office was stunned by startling news. Steve Blake was courting Mary, the new girl from the legal department. "'You're a piece of work,' Vicky said in a drawn-out voice. "'You pretend to be an innocent sheep. I don't know anyone and anything. And now this—' Mary shrugged her shoulders and walked out of the office. Steve, she said, looking at him very seriously, why are you doing this? Now I'm forced to leave the company. I just won't be able to work here. Do you think I can stand all the smirks and nasty smiles directed at me? There won't be any smirks and smiles at you. Everyone will shut up, he said. They'll shut up as soon as you marry me. Is that a proposal? 
Mary asked, shocked. Yes, he finally looked a little embarrassed. I'm sorry, it wasn't supposed to be like that. More romantic, more solemn somehow, right? Well, since it turned out this way, I want to ask, will you marry me? No, of course not, she exclaimed and left the office. A few days later, Mary and Steve were sitting in the living room of the Blake house, in front of Steve's parents. Mary, I beg your pardon for the way the proposal was made to you, said Marjorie. Believe me, it was from excitement, but it's not the form that matters, but the content. I ask you, or rather, she looked back at her husband, we ask you to accept Steve's proposal. What? Mary stared at the woman. But I was sure. I th I thought, I, I thought that, that I would be against it, finished Marjorie's thought. And why, in fact, should I be against it? Because you don't belong to our circle? Well, I never belonged to it either. I was just a simple, happy student. Then I married a sassy, handsome guy, and we happily ploughed along like two horses. And then an accident happened to us. We got rich. You see? She grinned. The memories of her journey to the Blake family flashed by in a few seconds, and Mary returned to the party. Steve was still nowhere to be seen among the guests. Steve. He had become strange lately, always disappearing somewhere, endless things to do. He himself had become nervous, irritable, looking terrible. Here, against the backdrop of his father and mother's blooming beauty, it was especially noticeable. Anna, apparently, had managed to calm the children down a little, who were no longer three, but four, because of Erica's fidgeting under her feet. She finally saw Mary and waved to her in greeting. Anna's husband was walking across the lawn at a brisk pace, shoving several canapes into his mouth as he went. Almost without stopping, he picked up his little son on one shoulder and Erica on the other, and shouting something joyfully, ran across the grass. The twins were following, howling in two voices. Watching the shrieking group scare away the guests strolling along the lawn, Marjorie smiled contentedly. Well, at last, she said. At least someone is having fun. By the way, Mary, where is your father? He received my invitation, and even kindly told me he would come. If Dad has promised, he will surely come said Mary confidently, unless, of course, something happens at the factory, and it seems that, yes, there he is. She saw her father striding across the lawn, a little nervously, but confidently, and noted to herself with pleasure that he looked no worse than most of the men present. It was only the bouquet in his hands that was disturbing. It clearly exceeded the limit Marjorie had set. Oh, my night! murmured the Jubilee, standing up to meet John. You have broken out from your work to me, after all, and how good it is. Don't worry, she added in a whisper as usual, reading Mary's thoughts without difficulty. I'll accept any bouquet from your father, for I have no doubt of his sincerity. Leaving her mother-in-law and father to pour streams of compliments and jokes on each other, Mary went to look for her husband. Besides, she suddenly felt the need to go to the restroom, and Mary took quick steps toward the house. The large hallway greeted her with coolness and silence, a pleasant respite from the constant buzz of voices, loud laughter and music. She and Steve had lived in a city apartment for a long time, and she hadn't visited this house often, but she remembered the guest restrooms located somewhere under the huge staircase. Venturing deeper into the house, she stared at several identical doors leading off the hallway. She pushed open the nearest door and peered inside. It definitely wasn't a restroom. The room appeared to be for storing cleaning supplies, with a huge rack of jars, boxes and vials dividing it in two. Suddenly, she heard muffled voices from the depths of the room. Oh, how embarrassing! 
I'm intruding where I'm not invited and eavesdropping, she thought, about to close the door quietly when she heard a familiar word. Trans energy. This strange name belonged to their main competitor for years. Lately, however, it had been oddly quiet, as if preparing to exit the transportation market. Keep your eyes peeled, Mr. Blake had warned. They're up to something. Our attention is being lulled. But to hell with it. The main thing is to win the tender for transporting goods for the new plant. Then I can take a well-deserved vacation. I don't like this lull, especially right before the bidding. It feels like an ambush. Who would discuss business and mention a competing firm in whispers in an empty house's back room? Mary's palms grew cold and clammy. She cautiously approached, hidden by the shelving unit. The voices became clearer, though still muffled. She strained to make out words and phrases. Trans Energy is in huge debt, and this tender your father is targeting is my only hope. I can't bring you down openly, so I need information. A male voice seemed to mint the words despite whispering. But I've already given you everything you asked for, our entire client base. The answering voice sounded pathetic and oddly familiar to Mary. I don't need company names and phone numbers. Don't take me for a fool. I can get those from the phone book, the first voice replied, irritated and angry. I need what we discussed last time. Transportation conditions, cargo details, actual tariffs, special discounts. I need a complete picture of how your father's company works with each client. Understand? Please be quiet. They might hear us. The other voice pleaded. Mary's heart seemed to freeze, then thundered so loudly she feared it would be heard. The second voice undoubtedly belonged to Steve Blake. You know, Steve, it's your problem that we're hiding here among the rags. I had to come and bother your mother with my congratulations. However, she's always despised me. Remember, the tender is in fifteen days. If I don't get solid information about your transactions... This will all be pointless. I don't understand, Steve's voice quavered. Why do you need all this information? You must be as dim as they say, Steve's interlocutor chuckled. I need to deal with your father. I'm sick of picking up his scraps. If I divulge information about his affairs, no businessman in the world will work with your father. Don't you understand that? But you'll destroy us completely. Steve seemed on the verge of tears. I can't do this. You're in no position to bargain. If you've said A, you must say B. What difference does it make how much information you've sold me? Come on, Steve. Give me some time, Steve's broken voice pleaded. How much? came the curt reply. Ten days, Steve mumbled. Too long, his interlocutor firmly stated. Five. But that's impossible. Steve's fear made him forget to whisper, but he quickly composed himself. Don't you understand? This isn't just contract data. I need to access my father's records, his correspondence. Much of it isn't even written down. It's in his head. It will take time to gather everything. You should have done this long ago especially considering the money you've received, the man insisted, determined to pressure Steve. Money? What use is that money to me now? It's long gone, and you know why. Your personal problems don't interest me. Speaking of personal matters, you have a charming daughter and a lovely wife. You wouldn't want anything unpleasant to happen to them, would you? Mary felt a sudden, violent faintness. She thought she might faint and instinctively grabbed the rack to steady herself. No, no, please, Steve shrieked. I'll do everything, everything. Please, don't touch Mary and Erica. Not them. Better me. I'll do anything. But how? 
My father never trusted me much. You know, I've always been third tier in the company, not even second. I've never really been interested in client relations. How do I explain my sudden interest to my father? That's not my problem. Think. I don't know. Fake a mental breakdown. A rethinking of yourself. Family. Family values. Explain that you've suddenly realized how important the common cause is to you. Get drunk with your father, for God's sake. Look, I'm sick of you. Maybe I should just go to your father and say, You know, Thomas, I need some information. You give it to me and I won't tell you anything about your son, Steve. How about that? Shut up. A new note suddenly appeared in Steve's voice. Not willful, but more like the desperation of a cornered animal. Shut up. Do you hear me? Get out. Get out of here. How rude, kicking a guest out of the house. But it's all right, I'm not offended. I expect your call tomorrow as usual with a report. And give my best wishes to your charming mother. I'll take my leave in English style, without saying goodbye. Mary squeezed herself into the dark corner formed by the shelving unit and the wall holding her breath. She got a good look at the man who passed by, and her hunch turned into certainty. It was the owner of Trans Energy. He walked out of the back room, carefully closing the door behind him. Mary rose from her squatting position, took a few deep breaths and moved deeper into the room. Steve was sitting against the wall, in exactly the same position from which Mary herself had just struggled to get out. He was sitting on the floor, hugging his knees tightly. His face was the colour of greyish paper, and drops of sweat covered his forehead and temples. He raised his eyes and looked at his wife. Steve, I heard everything, Mary said. He didn't seem surprised by what she said, or maybe he was too exhausted to show any more emotion. Mary walked over to her husband and sat down next to him on the floor. They were silent for a long time, as if each was afraid to be the first to break the silence. Why? she asked at last. Why? Steve asked back. Suddenly he burst. He jumped up, stood before her with a shaking chin and convulsively clenched hands. He was terrifying. Steve began to scream. Why? Because I hate you all. My mother, my father, my sisters, my brother. You! I hate you. All of you. Nobody ever gave a damn about me. No one ever cared about me. My parents even had a replacement for me. What was Walter for? Why? I became a laughing stock for everyone. I'd rather be dead. It was hysteria. A real, full-blown hysteria. Mary didn't know what to do in such situations. How to help a person. Suddenly she did something purely intuitive. She straightened up and slapped Steve which sounded like a gunshot in the small space. From the blow, or the sound, or both, Steve suddenly fell silent and shrank back. Yes, it would probably be better if you died, Steve, than betray your family. Tell me everything, Steve. Together we'll figure out how to save ourselves. We? he asked in a whisper. We? she confirmed firmly. A couple of years ago, he had started gambling, convinced that his father would never let him near the family business, and everything would be handed over to Walter when he grew up. Steve began looking for a way to get rich and prove himself to his father. Soon, the game became an addiction. He was a sick man. Mary was amazed to learn that their apartment had been long ago mortgaged, the car, which Steve had allegedly given for repair, was sold. He had also sold almost all valuable things stored in a safe deposit box. He began to borrow, re-borrow, and took out several loans. He was finally in over his head when a modest, inconspicuous man approached him and offered a meeting with someone interested in solving Steve's problems. It was the owner of the company Trans Energy. After a month, Steve was firmly on the hook, and then he was offered to do something that Mary now fully understood. Do 
do you realise I have no way out? He raised unseeing eyes to her. I'm scum. I'm guilty before all of you. I love you so much, but I don't have the right to even, even breathe the same air as you. Mary looked at him, pathetic, tortured, shaking with terror and self-loathing, and tried to figure out what she felt for him. Anger? Disgust? Pity? No, and no. And let no one believe her, because she doesn't even believe herself right now. But she loves this weak, pathetic, confused man. And even though she's thrice the fool, she doesn't care what's right or wrong. She moved towards him, wrapped her arms around his head, and pulled him against her. They sat like that for a long, long time, until finally Steve said, I've got it all figured out. It's so simple. God, it's incredibly simple. And I was looking for a way out for so long. And it was so close. I must go to my father and tell him everything, from beginning to end. I have to do it myself. Not you, not anyone else, just me. I'll be a scumbag and a liar and a traitor to them. I may break my parents' hearts forever, but I'll still be their son. A bad, lying, vile, despicable, mean son, but a son. A son who found the remnants of strength and conscience, and who will come back to them from the darkness. He wiped his cold, sweaty forehead, looked at Mary and said, But it was you. You did it. You showed me this way out. If it weren't for you, I would be going through my father's papers and my mother's things. I would be eavesdropping and hiding like a rat. And then I would be counting money with trembling hands. Thank you, my love. I've never told you how much I love you, Mary. If you'll stay with me after what I've done, I'll devote my life to you. You have plenty besides me to devote at least part of your life to, she said, taking his hand and rising. Come, Steve. We have a long journey ahead of us.